Um, anyway, it's incredible to be with so many friends and family, and that's what really truly feels like in this room tonight. Big bar mitzvah, as somebody described it earlier. To so many of us in this room, Dennis Prager is nothing less than family. He is the trusted voice we bring into our homes, cars, and offices as he dissects American politics and culture as we nod in agreement. And in a very real, real way, Dennis is RJC, RJC's family, serving on the Board of Fellows of the Jewish Policy Center, RJC's sister think tank. Dennis of one of, is one of America's most respected and popular radio talk show hosts on air Monday through Friday, 9 to noon, from his home station on Salem Communications. And Ed Atzinger, wherever you are, thank you for all you do. Dennis is the founder of Prager University, a virtual university aimed at educating people on conservative political and social views. He's the author of several best-selling books, actually not several, but many, including Why the Jews, and his most recent work, Still the Best Hope, which will be on sale later in, this lobby, in, in the lobby. If you, um, for those of you who live here, the Jewish Journal had a great, a wonderful review by David Suiza this week. Um, and I haven't read the book, but it just sounds wonderful, and I have a copy on my desk at home. Uh, perhaps most significantly, Dennis is a proud Republican Jew and one of the leading voices of our community and the cause. In fact, he is one of the founding members of our movement, especially here in Los Angeles. At a personal level, I am proud to have served together with Dennis on the board of the United States Holocaust Museum, both of us receiving our appointments from President George W. Bush, which makes the Vice President's appearance today even more special to us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the, to the Summer Bash my good friend and our good friend, Dennis Prager. Thank you, Joel Geiderman. You're a wonderful man, a wonderful doctor, a wonderful father, a wonderful human being. Thank you, everybody. I was told I have 15 minutes. I keep to it, even though I studied speaking under Fidel Castro. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, I will keep to it. It's as if I have a commercial. I, I think in these terms. So there's a commercial break in 15 minutes. So I will do it. Mr. Vice President, it's an honor to be with you, sir, and uh, all of you. There are so many wonderful people here. If I mentioned you by name, that would take up my 15 minutes. Let me just say something about Congressman Billy Long as I was listening. Only in America does a congressman, can a congressman, does a congressman, an official from a place like Southwestern, Ozark Mountain, Missouri, crack a joke about being a Shabbos Goy. There is no other country in the world, and I mean it sincerely, whenever this happens, I always say, only in America. And that deserves an applause for America, not for me, not for him, for America. The, the comfort level of Jews, and I specifically address this since most of us here are Jewish, the comfort level of Jews and non-Jews has never existed. I wrote a well-regarded book in, in its second edition on the history of anti-Semitism and its meaning. So I could tell you, and I taught this on a college level at the City University of New York, nowhere in the history of the Jewish people has there been such acceptance, respect, and comfort as in the United States of America. And there is a reason for that. By the way, I just want to say one other thing about the congressman's remark. We said he called a California mover. They are only moving in one direction since the Democrats took over California. So I just, it, it, they probably didn't understand somebody is moving into the state legally. This was probably, this probably shook them up and they didn't know what to do. That's the reason for the call. All right, a couple of words about this election. Uh, this is an election, as I say almost daily on my radio show, this is not an election. And I wish that, that Governor Romney would actually phrase it this way. This is not an election, it is a plebiscite on the future of the United States of America. It is not a normal election. 
So to say, we, what you hear often, it's the most important election in American history, this is beyond an election. It is beyond Barack Obama. It is about whether the United States will remain the United States ideologically or become European ideologically. That is the question. And here is what is most amazing. This is what can blow your mind. While Europe is in the descent, there is still a deep belief that that is the model civilization. I, I don't know if there is a parallel in human history of a civilization in decline being the model for another civilization. There may not be such a model, there may not be such an example in human history. The, the entitlement welfare state cannot work. It is not enough. It is not enough to have good intentions. For the left, intentions trump results. We mean well, we are good, we are wonderful, we are compassionate, we mean well, we care for the poor, we clothe the naked, we feed the poor, we are wonderful, you, Demic, you Republicans are awful. And that is enough. Policy doesn't matter, it's just knowing that you mean well. That is the plebiscite. The American value system, as I defined, I have now for 20 years since that great night about 20 years ago when I had my great epiphany about America. What our value system is has been contained on every American coin for most of American history. Liberty, in God we trust, e pluribus unum, what I call the American Trinity. Christianity has a trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Judaism has a trinity, God, Torah, and Israel. The left has a trinity, race, gender, and, and, uh, race, gender, and class. And America has a trinity. And that is liberty in God we trust and e pluribus unum. And the left is attempting to dismantle all, uh, all three of them, as I will explain in a moment. Liberty. Liberty is our, our calling card to the world. So that is why we were given a Statue of Liberty. When people think liberty, they don't think Sweden. They don't think Switzerland. They don't think any rich or richer country. They think America. If you did a blindfold test with someone in Mozambique, with someone in Paraguay, with someone in Burma, and said, liberty, what's the first country that comes to your mind? I would bet you everything that they would say the United States of America. Liberty, and not only liberty, but God wants liberty. This is an unbelievable innovation in human history. But the left has chosen equality, material equality over liberty. That is more important. I mean, and, and it manifests itself all the time in Norway, you are not free to choose your board of directors. Half of your board of directors must be women. That's equality over liberty. The taxation system. You are not free to keep your money. We want material equality. Material equality trumps liberty for the left. It is a clear difference. And the clearer Americans are on the differences, it's not about Barack Obama. It is about the left. It is about leftism versus Americanism. And this does not mean that leftists do not love America or are not patriotic. I don't, it's nonsense. That is not an issue to me. I don't care what you love. I care the values you articulate. Americanism and leftism are in a deep civil war. Thank God, and may it always be a peaceful one. Liberty versus equality. Number two, in God we trust. I don't care if you're an atheist. I don't care if you're an agnostic. I don't care if you're a deist. Without God, it is very hard for a civilization to endure. And again, Western Europe is an example. You know what determines whether people have babies? Not income. Rich Orthodox Jews, rich Catholics, rich Mormons have a lot of children. It's not money. It's faith. When God plays a role in people's lives, they reproduce their society. The more secular the society, the fewer babies they produce. And you know why? There's no reason to have children in the final analysis. It's more important to go to the theater, to eat out, and to travel. 
but to a religious person, a God-centered human being, children are vitally significant. So look at Western Europe. Germany is, is gradually disappearing. Russia is gradually disappearing. By the way, here's something Jews might find of interest, and I won't comment on this. It is possible that at the current rates of birth, there will be as many Jews or more Jews than Germans by the end of the 21st century. It's a very eerie, I'm, I'm not even asking for applause. I'm just, I don't wish the Germans ill, but it's a little eerie to think about it. And it's secularism. Why have children? God is big. I just read a study, and, and those who know my show know, uh, you know my view on studies. Uh, they either confirm what, uh, what common sense suggests or they're irrelevant. But, uh, and this one, by the way, confirms common sense. Listen to this. People who believe in heaven are just as likely or even more likely to commit a crime. But people who believe in hell are far less likely to commit a crime. No kidding. No kidding. Let me tell you something. You try to build a good civilization that is godless. <laughs> Read my essay that I, or my column from five, ten years ago, how I found God at Columbia University. I couldn't believe what my, te my professors were teaching me nonsense. The biggest one was men and women basically the same. You know, you give girls trucks, you give boys dolls, and <clears throat> boys will prefer dolls and girls will prefer trucks. People bought, but Larry Summers, the president of Harvard, bought this, and to his credit, he tells the story. He gave his daughter some trucks for a holiday. I don't know if it was Christmas, Hanukkah, I don't know what. And then after hours of silence, he was worried about her. He knocked the door, she was about nine years old. He had given her trucks because he believed in a non-sexist upbringing. He knocked on the door and the daughter goes, shh, daddy, quiet please, they're sleeping. <laughs> she had put the trucks to bed and had given them names. That's sweet. You give a boy a doll, not only does it not give it a name, it is armless within an hour. And that, and you're laughing because it's true. So I was learning, I learned that I was at the Russian Institute at Columbia, and I was, these great professors were telling me that America and the Soviet Union were equally responsible for the, for the Cold War. Another piece of nonsense. So finally I decided to, I, I went crazy. Why, am, why are bright people teaching me nonsense? And then something I had learned in Jewish school when I was in first grade, what we said every day in the prayers from Proverbs came to me. Wisdom begins with fear of God. No God, no wisdom. And that is why there is no wisdom at Columbia and no wisdom at UCLA. There are brilliant people but there is very little wisdom at the secular university. So when, when, when we have, uh, when we say the second of the American Trinity is in God we trust, that is correct. God is essential to a good society. And number three, and the one I want to concentrate on and then end, is e pluribus unum, from many one. The American value system said race doesn't matter, blood doesn't matter, family ties don't matter, nationality doesn't matter, ethnicity doesn't matter. The individual is an American. We don't care where you're from or what you look like. Did we violate it with blacks? We certainly did, and it is an everlasting shame in American history. But here is something to just know. And I, I wish, would wish that Mitt Romney would say this to, in the, to the NAACP when he speaks. More black Africans have emigrated to this country voluntarily than came here as slaves. That is an important statistic. Black Africans know there is no place better to live than the United States of America. We overcame race because the American value system says it is insignificant. The left says it is very significant. Multiculturalism is the opposite of e pluribus unum from many one. Elizabeth Warren, 132nd American Indian. Now, do you want, now I hate, I am not in any way comparing the left in any way to racism of the Nazis or anything like that, but the only people to go back to ask, are you 132nd anything, were the Nazis. This should be, this should, this should signal frightful things to us.
that it matters to Harvard. Harvard listed her as an Indian. One thirty second. Because she had high cheekbones in the family. But think about it. It's not funny. It's not funny. Harvard took that seriously. It was proud of it. We're not individuals. We're not Americans and we're not individuals to the left. We're, we're black Amer oh, excuse me, African American, Hispanic American, um, uh, in American Indian American. It's a terrible development in American life to see each other in, in terms of ethnicity and race rather than as fellow Americans. The playing to dividing Americans that is being done for this campaign, blacks, when the president said, it's amazing how this has not been regarded as a, as a terrible, irresponsible, demagogic moment when the president said if he had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin. The president knew nothing, nothing about what happened between George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. He knew nothing except that one was black and one was Hispanic and immediately made it a race issue and said, look blacks, we are really in trouble in this country. It was a despicable play for black allegiance and never called on it because who, who's gonna call them on it? The New York Times, the LA Times, CBS, NBC, CNN, NPR, PBS? Who's gonna call them on it? Yes, us, that's exactly right. It was a terrible moment. And then with Hispanics, to undermine law, he admitted that he can't violate, only Congress could make the laws with regard to illegal immigrants. And now he undermines that for the sake of a Hispanic vote. And of course, now he is just six months before the election, he has finally evolved into redefining marriage. Now, unlike the left, I can actually say there are good people on both sides of the issue on whether marriage should be redefined for the first time in history. I don't think it should be. And I have deeply beloved gays in my family. Uh, a, a niece and her partner who, whom I adore and whose child I, I regard as the same as my other nieces and nephews' children. But I don't think that uh, marriage should be redefined. I think it is, it is playing with fire that we, we don't even know the results of, um, perhaps not even in our lifetime. But there are good people on both sides of the issue, but they can't say that. The moment you think marriage should be between a man and a woman, you are hate-filled, you are a bigot, you are you are beneath contempt. So the play for that with six months to go, and then of course on the women's issue, equal pay for equal work. I had a caller call me up and said, I can't believe you're opposed to that, Dennis, just this week. So I said, well, let me, first of all, we already have anti-discrimination laws on the books, but let me just ask you one thing. If really women do in fact the identical work and the identical quality as men and get a 25% less, why would a, an employer be so stupid as to employ men? <laughs> and it was a very great moment. It was a great moment on the radio because there was total silence. And as we learned in Talmud and Yeshiva, shtika kahoda'a, silence is agreement. Let me end by this. We have a job to do as Republican Jews, and that is to talk first and foremost, not just to our fellow Americans, but to our fellow Jews. As I wrote in the Jewish Journal of Los Angeles in my column a couple of months ago, leftism is the Jew's golden calf. They worshiped a false idol when they left Egypt, and unfortunately, many of our dear fellow Jews, including members of our own families, are worshiping a golden calf today called leftism. But we should remind them of one thing. The reason we have it so good in the United States of America is not because of leftism. It is because of liberty, in God we trust, and e pluribus unum. Thanks very much.